Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Fleece again from Central New Mexico Community College and we're going to discuss the uh, major characteristics of the epithelial tissues in video B here in our series on the epithelial tissues. Remember there are four categories of tissues. The epithelial tissues, connective tissues, muscle tissues, and nervous tissue. And each one of them has a series of pretty interesting characteristics. And we're going to focus on those of the epithelial tissues here. So this slide is a summary of all of those characteristics. And um, I'm going to use diagrams to, dis to explain and describe uh, these various features. And we will focus first on the uh, features listed here on the left-hand side. And then we'll move on to the features on the right-hand side. So let's use my silly diagrams here to get a better understanding of the typical arrangement of tissue layers in the body. So here near the top left, we see an, a small image sketch that I made illustrating a, a hollow organ. And I've made it a tube, but it could be any shape, obviously. And so far, you're already familiar with the fact that epithelial tissue, which is in the blue here, is always going to line the lumen of our hollow organ, and it's going to cover our organ as well. So what about the rest of the wall of our hollow organ? Well, let's say we take out a nice little chunk out of our organ. See this sort of triangle here? I have replicated that there, and then literally filled in the various layers again with their corresponding colors. So once again, this right here represents the, the covering um, epithelial tissue. And here we have, I'm not going to label it as such, but this is the lining epithelial tissue. I chose you to cho I chose to show you an epithelial tissue that is made up of several layers of cells. There could be many more, or there could be just one layer. But for simplicity's sake, I just gave you a few layers um, to better understand all these functions, and I'm sorry, all these characteristics of epithelial tissues. And then we see in the red here, we see connective tissue. And the reason why I choose the red color for the connective tissue here is because they're going to be vascularized. Um, and we'll understand better in just a moment why that is. And then finally, in the green here, that is going to be both muscle tissue as well as nervous tissue. All right, so the muscle tissue and nervous tissue is going to be kind of combined together in that green layer. Okay, so let's focus particularly on the epithelial tissue. And um, I'm going to especially focus on the lining here, the, the uh, lining of our lumen. And we need to introduce you to some terminology. So we have cells that are in, that are going to be right next to our connective tissue right here. And so we will refer to them as the basal cells. On the other hand, the cells that sit at the very top here, and these are cells that literally are in touch or connect or in contact, I should see, say, with the, with the contents of the lumen, we call them apical cells. Now, we can also refer to the surface of our apical cell. So this surface and this surface here and this surface there, these surfaces or that surface together but of all these three cells, we can call the apical surface. So the apical surface always faces the lumen. On the other hand, the basal surface, and I'm going to use a yellow color so you can see better what I'm drawing. So this would be your basal surface, right? And they belong to your basal cells. And that's the surface that faces the connective tissue. 
Now the cells that form the apical surface can have various adaptations. Um, and so I'm going to draw these here real quick for you on the side. So let's say that this is a surface, uh, I'm sorry, an apical cell. And here's another one. And here's another one. I'm purposely showing a slightly different shaped cell than the one I have in my bigger picture, but um, that's okay. So notice that my the first cell I drew here has a smooth apical surface. This one, on the other hand, has cilia. And try to recall what cilia do. You've learned about this in interbiology. Remember, they're little hairs, and their function is to move something along. For instance, we see cilia, we see cilia lining the inside of our oviduct so that our eggs are moved along. We see cilia lining our uh, trachea, our windpipe, such that little particles that are trying to sneak into our trachea all the way into our lungs are moved back upwards. And then what we do is actually swallow them. Um, and then finally, here we have microvilli. And what are they? They are little finger-like projections on the surface of our cell. Right, little finger-like projections. And notice, and I'm going to um, enlarge our slide here, notice how, give me just a moment here, notice how if we compare the surface area of our smooth cell with the surface area of the cell that does have microvilli. Right, so this cell with the microvilli has a much, much, much bigger surface area compared to this cell that has just a very smooth surface. And so microvilli come in very handy when um, something needs to be able to make it into the cell. Let me use a different color here. Maybe little particles that need to make it into our cells. If there is a bigger surface area, then the chance of these particles of making into making it into our cell is going to be much, 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 much higher, right? And where is this important? This is very important in your small intestine, for instance. So these are the nutrients that you ate, and they've been broken down to small enough particles. They can now be moving into our epithelial cell. And remember, all epithelial cells are always going to sit on a basement membrane, BM for basement membrane. And then deeper to that, we have connective tissue. Well, I'm using red for connective tissue here on purpose, because that brings up a, a new feature of um, or a feature of the connective tissues, I should say, and that is that they are usually very vascularized. And to be vascularized means to be with blood vessels. And so we're going to see why it is important for these blood vessels in the connective tissue to be present and uh, in relation to the characteristics of the epithelial tissues in just a moment. But for now, we're going to see that these particles that have made it into our epithelial cell can now also make it into our bloodstream. And so now we're literally describing the process of absorption, right? So this is what happens in your small intestine when you absorb food. And when your food or your food particles are in the, connective, in the blood vessels of the connective tissue, clearly once they're in the blood, they can go anywhere in the body, and cells anywhere in the body can access those food particles, glucose, amino acids, etc., um, to make ATP and do other things with, right? To make new proteins with and, and much, much more. So right away, something to notice is that your connective tissues, no matter where they are, they're always going to be interconnecting 
other tissues. That's primarily why they're given the name connective tissues. They connect one tissue with another, no matter where they're located. Muscle tissues and nervous tissues in a sense too, um, but really that's why connective tissues get their name. Now, if we take a look at the epithelial tissue, whether you're looking at this one or the one we want to focus, stay focused on here, the one that lines the lumen, notice that epithelial tissue is always going to have one free surface side, and we've been calling it the apical surface. And by that I mean that is going to be the surface that faces the lumen. Or if we're talking about our skin and I'm scratching the surface of my my hand, I'm literally scratching the apical surface of the epithelial cells that form the epidermis. All right, and so all epithelial cells always have um, a surface, epithelial, uh, I'm sorry, cell surface that is not connected to other tissues. And because of that, we sometimes say that epithelial cells express polarity. So they have a free surface side and they have a side that is connected. It's kind of analogous to saying that the planet Earth has a North Pole and a South Pole. So the term polarity that is listed on your previous slide is not, has nothing to do with uh, the chemical properties that you've learned about molecules such as water molecules have um, polarity. We're not talking about the chemical level of polarity here. We're just describing that the fact that epithelial tissue has a direction, essentially, meaning that it has one side that's not attached to another tissue and the other side is. So that expresses polarity, what are apical cells, basal cells, and what is the apical surface versus the basal surface. Now, all epithelial tissues are always going to sit on a what we can call a foundation made up of a bunch of molecules called the basement membrane. So this black line of various molecules, notice I'm not saying cells, this is just a bunch of molecules, supports our epithelial tissue and ensures that our epithelial cells are going to stay here and not start mixing with the connective tissues. All right, so that is the basement membrane and only epithelial tissues have such a thing separating them for the neighboring connective tissue. Now, the basement membrane is made up of two layers separate or two distinct layers, I should say, of uh, molecules and those layers have different names. Um, when we get to the connective tissues, those different names um, will make much more sense. But I need to stress again, the basement membrane is primarily just made up of uh, proteins that arrange themselves in little fiber, fiber type of, of molecules, as well as um, sugars. So there are no cells. So we can say that the basement membrane is acellular, right? Without, oops, let me use a different color here. A, the letter A meaning without, acellular, without any cells. It's made up of a bunch of molecules. Okay. So, um, that, that explains now what we mean by polarity. That now explains the function of the basement membrane. And we're going to come up with uh, uh, even a better understanding of the function of the basement membrane as we continue to discuss these characteristics. So another common feature of all epithelial tissues is that they're very packed with cell. So each cell sits right next door to the next cell and right on top of the cell below it, etc., etc. There's very, very little extracellular space, right? So I will let me use a different color so that you can keep track of where we are kind of. So there's very little extracellular space, very cellular, this tissue. Um, and therefore, oops, cellular, I misspelled that. Um, and therefore, 
we often see all kinds of adaptations in between epithelial tissues. So, um, and we would refer to these as membrane junctions. So these membrane junctions should be a little bit of a review of what you've learned about in interbiology. So I'm not going to go into these in great detail. They're discussed in your book in um, under uh, membrane junctions. So be sure that you can recognize them, you can list them. So there are the tight junctions where um, it makes the, the junctions between the cells are such that it's very difficult for, let's say, um, molecules or ions to make it, I should say ions and molecules, yes, to make it from one cell uh, to the next cell. On the other hand, when we have gap junctions, there are little tunnels, as you can see here, that allow for uh, ions to move from one cell to another cell. We see this especially in the heart. And then we're, this semester especially, going to talk a little bit more about the so-called desmosomes, which we also see in the heart, um, but they are going to be made up of um, these little um, structures that almost look like the teeth of a, uh, a zipper. And one cell membrane surface has one set of teeth, so here are the desmosomes, and the other cell surface has the other set of teeth of the zipper, and so they hold the cells tightly together like so. There's a lot of detail in this slide. By no means do I expect you to know all of those details, but you have to have a bit of a visual in your mind of the difference between each one of these membrane junctions. So the desmosomes really um, cause or allow for cells to stay connected to one another. It's part of the reason for why when you have a sunburn and you peel, your skin is going to peel in big pieces, right? It's not like one cell falls off at a time.